After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense. Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. When Herod heard the news of this new king, he and all Israel were troubled. That's what Matthew 2 3 says. But they were not troubled enough to travel six miles. That's the distance between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. They couldn't be bothered to make a trek of six miles. I wonder why. I wonder why they couldn't have done that. When, when you think about the Magi, the Magi are not necessarily God followers. They're not necessarily Christ seekers but they knew something spectacular was about to happen and they traveled 800 miles now the scene you saw on there was with them on camelback I'm not so sure they might have been on the the most prestigious beautiful steeds that they could have found because they were important men themselves whether it was camel or horse doesn't really matter it still took them about 40 days. This was not a government subsidized trip. They bore the cost of this trip all on their own. Imagine, what would you do that would take 40 days out of your life? And frankly, when you think about the return trip, it took 80 days out of their lives that no one was paying you for. No one was encouraging you to do. Nobody even understood what you were doing or why you were doing it. What is it that you would invest 80 days of your life? I think there's one very interesting lesson that comes out of this initial opening scene in Matthew chapter 2. It is that you can never predict who will respond to or reject the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God became flesh in the child Jesus and Jesus lived his life showing us how to live, showing us how God would behave and then he took our sin on himself and he died in our place. But he didn't stay in the grave, he rose from the dead. And we have proof. And his resurrected life gives new life to every single person who puts their faith and trust in Christ. That is the gospel or the good news. And it is difficult to predict who would accept the gospel 
and who would reject the gospel because those who you think should have all the reason to accept it, the, the, the religious leaders in all of Jerusalem who were upset by this news, and those who have no reason to invest in it. I kind of wonder how the magi, or we call them the wise men, how did they know that this was going to happen? Well, we know by their, that their title, Magi, that they were, they were master astronomers. They, they looked at the skies and they, 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 they noticed things that were happening. But there's something more, I think, going on. I think they might have had, had access to just a little bit of biblical truth. And, and this is not going to come up on your screen, but you can write it down and check it out for yourself later if you want to. In the middle of the book of Numbers. Now, when's the last time you read the book of Numbers? Anybody read the book of Numbers last week? Connie, my wife read Numbers last week. She's the only other person in the whole... <laughs> now, <laughs> now it, it happens in the book of Numbers, and it happens by a prophet who, the, really the only thing we know about him is he was so obstinate that God had to use a donkey to talk to him. Balaam. Balaam makes this prophetic um, uh, statement but he, he says I see him but not now I behold him but not near a star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel that's um, Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17 if you want to look that up on your own now to me that, that really isn't enough to, to make you think about this but for someone who was a stargazer someone who understood the movements of the stars and could predict things and all that sort of thing, like the Magi, maybe they had some knowledge of that. We know that they did not have the entirety of the Old Testament because they didn't know Micah 5, 2, the passage that's quoted in Matthew chapter 2. Out of you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, will come a king. Right? They didn't know that. So we know they probably had a limited amount of of exposure to God's word, but not a full exposure to God's word. Think about that for a moment as, as we let the, the concept of what drove the Magi kind of percolate. Now let me ask you a question. Does anyone here wish that you would have had the privilege to see the baby Jesus? Anybody? I know right before I came up to preach, um, a baby was put into my, my wife's arms, and I had turned over, learned, looked over to her, and I said, oh, I've just lost you, haven't I? <laughs> Usually, when I'm preaching, if everyone else falls asleep, Connie, Connie holds it together, toothpicks in her eyes, whatever. That right now, she's, she's a gaga over a baby. And that's the way babies are, right? How many of us wish we could have gone and seen the baby Jesus? I mean, yeah. We would have loved to go and see the baby Jesus. How crazy would that be? These people knew where the baby Jesus was to be born. And the city of Bethlehem, as I thought about it, I wondered how difficult would it be to find someone in the city of Bethlehem. Then I thought about our cities, the largest, three largest cities in the world, Seoul, South Korea, 10,231,000 people. Imagine finding one baby in that city. Or Sao Paulo, Brazil, second largest city in the world, 10,009,000 people. Some of you will recognize some of these pictures. Third largest city, Bombay, India, 9,921,000 people. Imagine what it would be like to try to find one baby in that little city. You know how big Bethlehem was? Probably about 300. It would have been kind of like this. Now, it would not have been impossible to find Jesus here, and, but it wouldn't have been, you know, totally simple. You would have had to work a little bit, but, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that it could have happened. Why didn't they travel six miles to see him? What are you willing to walk six miles for? What does God have so close in your life that you're not taking advantage of? 
oftentimes when we think of Christmas, we think about we think about the Christ child and we think about the gift he gave us and we think about all the ways that God has blessed us. But as we journey to Jerusalem, as we journey to, excuse me, Bethlehem together, I want us to think about what is it that God has for us and what does he want us to, to, to pour back into the world? What does he want to give us so that we can give back? How does he want us to seek after him? What does he want to say to us that will revolutionize the way we live our lives? That will challenge, encourage, and equip us to walk those six short miles. I listened to a podcast this last week by Dr. Michael Brown. I don't know if you guys ever listened to him. Um, He listed off seven promises from God's word. And I want to share those promises with you today. And I wonder, I wonder if we'd be willing to take them to heart. Matter of fact, as I list these seven things off, I want to challenge you to consider as as you see see the, the promise itself and as you reflect on it, if it resonates with you. I want to ask you if today you would say, I'm going to walk six miles for that this Christmas. You may not be able to do all seven. So just pick one so that you can walk six short miles and get to the place of peace and confident assurance and usefulness that God has in mind for every single one of us for his kingdom this Christmas. Seven six-mile walks. Now, as I move into this, I know that, that during this time of year, Many of us are suffering from sadness. Um, We've lost someone that's close to us. Some of us have have a constant struggle with depression. And we deal with different things. We have fears that overwhelm us. And we're in situations, whether it's relational or maybe financial, um, maybe our business is, is in trouble. And we have all kinds of struggles. And I'm not going to say to you, here, take take a verse and call me in the morning. What I am going to say, what I think God says to us in the midst of our pain, is if you'll look to me, if you'll take me seriously, if you'll see what I've told you and you will own it, then I will change your life. I am not going to promise that God will change your circumstance, but I am going to promise, based on what God says, that he will change you and me in the midst of our circumstance. The first promise. God is with us, therefore we do not need to fear. God is with us, therefore we do not need to fear. Here's a psalm that that many of you know by heart. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Do you believe that? Will you walk six miles to that promise? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't say I'm going to protect you from it. Realize it's a shadow. It's not the real deal. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, when you die... You do not cease to exist. You move from this existence into the true life with God forever. And we have no reason to fear even though we walk through that valley of the shadow. Isaiah 43 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Now, he doesn't Say, I'm going to keep you from all those things. He says, yeah, you're going to walk through the fire. You're going to be amidst the flames. Maybe some of you are there now. The flood is going to come. And, and my, my friend Ray Buker would say, hey, I'm, I'm just trying to keep one nostril above water. Maybe you can relate to that. I will be with you. He will be with us in the midst of it. Even if this... be. Uh, It's the worst time you've ever been through. He will be with you through it. 
And if this becomes real, if it gets a grip on us, it will change the way we live our lives. It will change the outcome, excuse me, the, the outlook that we have, and it will change the outcome. Because when we rely on God only, then we'll see how faithful he is. And we'll see that he's there with us every single step that we take. God is with us, therefore we do not need to be afraid. Second, God has made promises to us. He's made all kinds of promises to us, thousands of promises throughout the Old and New Testament. Some of them are specific to Israel. They don't apply to us. But the principle behind them are, are truths that we can understand about God's character and how he functions. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Through God's promises, when we hold on to them, we partake of his nature. That is, he makes us more like himself. So it not only benefits us, it benefits other people around us when they see a change and a difference in us. He has given us everything we need. God himself has taken up residence inside of you and inside of me. Third promise, even in darkness, light shines for the righteous. Psalm 112 says, even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for the gracious and the compassionate and righteous man. We are the people of the resurrection. So we live in hope. If you knew nothing else but that Jesus lived, died in your place, and rose from, from the dead, that would be enough to give you hope. He is who he said he is. What he said he would do, he will do. It is true. And he crowned that truth with another simple truth by defeating our common enemy, death, through the resurrection. And that's the life he promises you and me. Fourth promise. He causes all things to work together for our good. Now, he doesn't say that all things will be good. He says, I will work all things together for your good. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are the called according to his purpose. And how do we know that? How do we know that? I mean, it's one thing for, for God to make that statement, but how can I be sure that it's true? Well, we have to look at the, the next couple of verses because he was committed to you before you were ever born. He was committed to you before anything was created. He was committed to you. And he will be committed to you until you are fully realized the, the, the transformed person that God wants you to be, fully glorified in his presence. So Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. He foreknew you and he predestined. He said it to be something true. People ask me, do you believe in predestination? Well, yeah, it's right there. I don't believe in some of the crazy things that people say about predestination, but we can't be afraid of what the Bible says because here is a great source of comfort. If he foreknew you and you know that he foreknew you because you came to put your faith and trust in Jesus. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, it's because he foreknew you. And when he foreknew you, he had already, as though it already happened, predestined you to become like his son. That's security. He predestined, um, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Even the worst situation can be turned around for the good. Some of you could share testimony after testimony of how you've gone through a horrendous thing and God turned it around for good. Even if you can't see it today, I want to encourage you, if you're going through a tough time today, the thing that will encourage you right now is to take some time this afternoon and pray back over your life and ask God to bring to memory things that have happened in your life that were bad. 
and show you how he used them for good in your life. And see if he's not faithful. See if it's not true. God is not afraid of us questioning him. He's not afraid of us testing him in these. Ask him. Let him show you how he's been working in your life. I have no idea how God is going to turn the, the, the death of John Allen Cho's, um, how he's going to turn John Allen Cho's death into something good. We talked about him last week, a 26-year-old young man who went to the North Sentinel Island to share Jesus with them, and they killed him for it. And maybe you've seen some articles in the newspaper, some crucifying him, saying he never should have gone. He was out of his, out of his right. He shouldn't have done that. But this is what the gospel calls us to do, to, to take the message of Jesus to people who've never heard. I mean, that's who we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to do. I encourage you to keep following this story and see how God takes it and uses it for something good, even though the enemy is fighting against it and saying that it's something very bad. The other thing that I know about God is to the extent that the thing is negative or painful, the upside will be incredible. The upside will be incredible. Listen to how God came, came through for Job at the end of his life in Job 42. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. He had hundred, excuse me, 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. Now, I'm not saying that if you are faithful that God is going to give that to you just like he did Job. It may look different. It may be that God calls us to, to, to follow after him and it, and it costs us our life. But if that happens, we are delivered into his presence and everything we ever longed for is ours. We can't lose. You get that? You can't lose. You can't lose if you have Christ. The only thing the enemy can do is threaten you with death. And death is not a tragedy, it's an upgrade. Think about the cross. We look at the cross. Is the cross a place of torture? A place of abandonment? Is it a place of humiliation? Is it a place of death? No. No. The cross is a place of redemption. It's a place of forgiveness. It's a place of life. It's a place of eternal hope. God causes all things to work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. Fifth promise, joy comes in the morning. You may go through a difficult time, but God will always bring joy in the morning. For his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Weeping in this passage doesn't make its bed in your heart. It shouldn't. Weeping is not, uh, is not even a house guest. Weeping is, is, a, is a visitor that comes once in a while. The difficult times come once in a while. You know what makes home? It's home in us? Joy. Joy should be that thing that is constantly with us. How did, how did Paul say it? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, and I will say rejoice. How do we do that? I mean, how did Paul do it? Paul was in prison when he wrote that. Because joy was resident in him. Joy had a room in the home of his heart. Weeping did not. When we take God at his word, joy is always a present presence in our lives. In the midst of, of Israel's judgment, God brought a prophet to the, the nation, Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. All the way throughout the book of Jeremiah, there's all kinds of really sad things happening, and Jeremiah is just weeping before God because of it. He wrote a book called Lamentations. There's another reason why he's called the weeping prophet. Lamentations means lamenting, crying, weeping. But listen to what he said in the middle of it. 
Lamentations 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Never, never. Get that? They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Joy comes in the morning. Have you found the promise yet that you're going to walk six miles for this week? Number six, we have a personal future hope. We have a personal future hope. Even if suffering and pain is something that is in your foreseeable future, maybe the rest of your life, you don't even have to be someone who's getting older to experience this. You can have an accident. Um, Tim asked us to pray for Julie. They were, they were riding horses at midnight near the pyramids. Now that is a cool thing to do. And she fell off her horse, bruised her hip, broke her collarbone, this collarbone. And she's toughing it out, doing the ministry, doing the things that they needed to do. But even if she had to go through pain the rest of her life because of that injury, whatever the difficulty, whatever the pain, whatever the suffering, it pales in comparison to what God has for us. Now, I know that is a hard thing to say. But listen to what Paul said. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now, remember that phrase. This light momentary affliction. What's it doing? It's preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison as we look to the things that are not, that, excuse me, the things that are seen, but to the things unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, light momentary affliction. Help me out here. What did Paul suffer? What were some of the things that Paul went through? He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. He, he was whipped. He was beaten several times. In prison. It, yeah, he had all kinds of horrible things happen to him, right? Okay, light momentary affliction. Would you, would you if you were to define light momentary affliction, I'd maybe think a hangnail. <laughs> An ingrown hair. Had both of those. They're a bummer. Toothache. Light momentary affliction. That's what he called it. Paul suffered a lot. Paul was well acquainted with what we might feel like when he went through some very, very difficult times. I just read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But back in second and, and chapter 1, in verse 8, we read this. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. That's the same guy. We despaired of life itself. How did he get from there to light momentary affliction? Verse 9. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. And Paul, throughout his entire life, did not waver even down to the moment where he was about to die in second timothy chapter four we read i am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come i fought the good fight i have kept the faith i have finished the race the lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the gentiles might hear it so i was rescued from the lion's mouth the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. See, 
deliverance isn't just getting out of the situation. Deliverance is also the promise that he makes to every single follower of Jesus as we are delivered into his presence, no matter what happens in this world, no matter what we go through. That light momentary affliction that you are enduring is preparing you for the eternal weight of glory. Seventh promise. God's side and God's ways will always prevail. Short and to the point, God wins. And we are on his side, we win. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. This will happen. That's what he says. Psalm 37 says, for the evildoers shall be cut off but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while the wicked will be no more Though they look carefully at his place, he will not be there, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The meek. The meek are those who yield their strength, their power, their authority, their everything to God and allow God to call the shots. They are willing to walk six miles to Bethlehem. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. A little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is going to happen. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. This is God's promise to you and to me, to the world whether people accept it or not, this is going to happen. I like the way Michael Brown kind of summarized these thoughts. In tough times, God often intervenes. But when he doesn't actively intervene, and you've probably been there, we often have his presence. When we don't sense his presence, we still have his promises. And when we lose sight of his promises or they don't seem to come to pass, we still have our future hope. You cannot lose when your faith is in God and in God alone. When someone rejects you because you are standing with God, don't be afraid. Even if they have the power to cut off your wealth, to take your position or influence, or even harm you physically, don't fear. God is with you. Stand with God and instead pray for them because they're not fighting you. They're fighting God. God will take care of you. Even if the rest of your life is filled with pain. So Paul ends Ephesians chapter 6 with these simple words, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Like the Magi, stand with God. Who were the Magi? As I mentioned earlier, they weren't magicians, as we kind of take that name and lengthen it out. No, Daniel, uh, the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, he was called a Magi. In, um, in the, the courts of Cyrus, um, the, the great and Darius the third a magi served so we, we had the idea that magi were probably just royal advisors but they're very well educated very wise people who paid attention to what was happening in the stars and when they did they, they more than just wrote notes and they, but they, they thought about it and they acted on it the magi followed God's prompting it said in verse 2 we saw the star when it rose and have come to worship him and then 
even more strange, these are not necessarily, they're not Hebrews. They're not necessarily God worshipers. We don't really know much about them. But God spoke to them. I mean, how many of you want to hear God speak to you? I mean, think of that. God spoke to these guys. And they respond even though they knew it would put them in opposition to a vengeful pretender who guarded his throne with ruthless resolve. That's who Herod was. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. History remembers Herod in all his treacherous glory. He murdered two of his own sons along with their mother, his favorite wife, Miriam. He executed his other favorite son, Antipor, because he thought he was plotting against him. He uh, killed 45 members of the Sanhedrin, several hundred members of their family, as well as some of his staff because he suspected they were in on the plot against him. And then, because he knew that, that people just despised him, he gathered up all sorts of well-loved, well-liked people, as well as many, very many important people in Jericho Stadium with this command, as soon as I breathe my last, as soon as I am dead, I want you to slaughter those people. Because he wanted to make sure that there was mourning throughout the land of Israel when he died. And he knew nobody would miss him. That's Herod. That is what he was about. Rather than give in to his threats, the Magi listened to God, took their lives into their hands. The Magi risked the wrath of a ruthless, paranoid, vengeful, despotic ruler. They bore the expense of this trip themselves. They brought gifts worthy of a king. And they willingly made the costly investment to follow God. When we came to First Baptist Church a little over eight years ago, Connie and I prayed that God would, would bring some other godly adults into the lives of our kids to invest in them. One day, a young lady named Paige came up to me and asked if it would be okay if she met with our daughter, Elena. Now, we both, Connie and I both knew Paige's vibrant love for Jesus and her desire to tell the world about his love. And so we're like, yes, Absolutely. We would love for you to spend time with our daughter. And, and I, I just thought that they'd spend time after church or they'd come to our house and hang out and do things. But no, it, it didn't take long before I, I began to understand Paige a little better. She took, she took Elaine out to coffee. She took her shopping. She took her to the movie. She took her all kinds of outings and things. And a few weeks into it, I asked Paige, you know, how's it going? She's like, well, you know, Dad, I can't tell you too much about that. But I just want you to know that, that we're really talking about Jesus and, and praying that God will do some things in your daughter's life. And, um, and then, I, then I said, I, I, I said I, I'd like to give you some money because I, I, this is costing you a lot of money to go and do these things. And she's like, you know, no, I, I, really, I really don't want that. And what she said really just floors me to this day. She said, mentoring someone costs and I'm learning to make the investment. What are we willing to make the investment towards? What are we willing to walk those six miles for? What is God saying to us? What will it cost you to walk those six miles? Are you willing to make the necessary investment? Like the Magi, standing with God requires that we invest ourselves in God's promises. Christmas, as we learned from Joseph last week, is about giving God the gift of loving sacrificial obedience. It is also about taking God at his word, believing what he said so that he can fill you with hope. This Christmas, invest yourself in God's promises and he will fill you with hope. Said another very simple way. Walk six miles to Bethlehem this week. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for, for the example of the Magi. It's amazing to me that these, these men who, who had no reason to 
give so sacrificially of themselves and of other resources except they wanted to honor you and they wanted to stand with you and they were willing to make the investment. Let their example encourage us this year to stand with you and to invest for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.